All right, so here we are ready to start our uh, second panel of the three for today. Um, just a reminder, if you're just joining us, we encourage you to put any questions you might have for the panel uh, in the Q&A box as you think about them. No need to uh, wait until the end. Um, so this session, we're really looking at tax professionals and thinking about both their ethics um, and their role in enforcement kind of a little bit separately. Uh, and the ethics piece, I think, flows so much from where we uh, really ended our first uh, our first session this morning. Uh, and so I thought I'd start off by asking the question, you know, what are some of the most um, significant or pervasive um, ethical dilemmas that you see tax professionals facing today? And you can think about whether that's in terms of general categories, sort of concrete examples, but but what are we seeing as sort of you know important ethical dilemmas that they're facing? Because obviously then that's what we want to be thinking about um, helping them um, address and what that really looks like. So I'll just sort of open it up. Uh, I'm happy to jump in. If that's oh, absolutely right. Scott. Jump so I'm Scott Cummings. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I would just highlight a couple of classic dilemmas that 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 do seem to recur from the point of view of legal ethics. I teach legal ethics, and so I've thought about um, regulatory compliance and the lawyer's role in this issue. Um, and I think you know, in the tax context, one issue that comes up repeatedly that's not specific to tax but plays out in particular ways is just ensuring accuracy of client information um, <clears throat> in a context in which the business expertise of the client may make that hard to do on the from the from the point of view of the, of the lawyer but it's necessary in order to ensure that the accuracy um, and veracity of the lawyer's representations made to regulatory agencies and potentially in court so I think the the accuracy piece um, and kind of understanding how that plays out is a really key issue, and then you know, obviously the, the the other the other big one is just um, the degree to which lawyers should take aggressive uh, legal interpretations and positions on behalf of clients in front of regulatory agencies versus the degree to which they should be um, counseling uh, clients in in ways that are that are designed to synchronize with systemic values. And I think that's another recurrent issue that's that's really important to talk about. Right. Others that you might like to add to the picture if we're thinking about where are these ethical push and pulls, Daniel. Yeah, I would just like to add to uh, to uh, uh, Scott's comment that to the extent that uh, you're being asked to um, uh, take an aggressive tax position, some kind of tax shelter that you're not comfortable with. Uh, and uh, Saviyama says you, maybe you should just say no. Uh, but then on the other hand, if you lose your, uh, uh, if you say no, and the and your uh, and the partnership you're working for uh, loses the client because the client can get that position uh, written somewhere else, you don't make partner. Uh, and uh, so what uh, what do you do in that sort of a situation when you're you facing that uh, self interest and 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 uh, professional careers on the line uh, if you're if you're trying to take some kind of a moralistic stand and that puts you in a tough position. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, uh, just uh, sort of um, adding to what uh, Daniel said. I mean, it's also a situation where uh, you know, forgetting about. Uh, the, the making partner aspect of it, but it, there is a financial implication. If um, oftentimes the uh, most challenging clients and those who uh, are potentially taking positions uh, that you do not agree with are often your largest clients. And uh, you run the risk of losing that client and therefore negatively impacting uh, your firm and uh, uh, yourself personally. So that is uh, clearly a challenge. Jens. Um, in our um, exposure draft, we will address an issue which is uh, in the gray zone. So if you're thinking that is no credible basis, it's not illegal, but it's an issue where you have to discuss and, and, and you are not convinced on a certain direction which the client wants to go, there's also the question whether you should, for example, inform in the hierarchy of the client the next level. 
those charged with governance because perhaps it's not in line with a published ESG sustainable taxation strategy, et cetera. All these type of issues where you have a certain situation and you, you may have some uh, detriment out of this uh, because an um, important client relationship is in danger. So similar to what, what Henry and Daniel said, but we spe specifically want to address also the question who I should address not outside, but inside the client uh, organization. Scott. Uh, yeah, mute. Never can, mm -hmm. never can, never can remember that <laughs> after all this time. I, I think that those are all great points. And one thing that I that I might add in terms of the issue regarding, um, you know, potential loss of business, loss of status within firms, is just the regulatory environment and the competitive market environment also includes other actors like accounting firms and so it's not just potentially losing business to other firms but um seeding space within that environment to other actors and that's another important competitive pressure amparo yeah i was gonna say that there should be a balanced or middle uh, way orientation between hippocratic oath and a conscientious objector in this field when it's not so clear. So let's look at the medical profession. Uh, and in the picture, we are considering uh, society's interest and taxpayer interest, but uh, we are missing uh, the view of the tax professional interest himself or herself. So uh, here, I think if it's a slippery road, uh, we should uh, try to give uh, some sort of uh, way out or uh, protected. Thank you. And, and actually, Amparo, that that kind of I think really moves to almost sort of the next really obvious question, which is, you know, how can we help tax professionals navigate these tensions, right? And, and you know, you know. Where do you see, or how can you see, professional ethics um, or sort of fundamental values of some type, um, you know, guiding the tax professional through this? You know, for example, can tax ethics sort of do professional ethics do that work? How can how could it do that? And if not, you know, Jens? The standard said I must be convinced that um, uh, professional ethics is a possibility to, to, to guide the professional. But again, this having a, a code of ethics is not enough. There is an educational issue. Having case studies, have, having the possibilities to consult the professional organization in in a dilemma situation, what is right, what is wrong, having the right culture in a, in a uh, accounting firm or law firm, that those issues are addressed, that you are able to, to, to discuss with colleagues, with senior, more experienced people, uh, such issues. I think that is uh, the environment where such a framework is working. If you have not this environment, you may have the best code of ethics, but it doesn't work. Scott. I agree with that 100%. I mean, institutional um, culture and structure is key. Um, in the best case scenario, ethics get overwhelmed by market pressures and practice pressures. And so having institutional culture is, is critical, but it's, it's a broader uh, sectoral issue, I think, um, because individual firms, as we just talked about, um, could have higher ethical standards or particular positions about these that would then uh, uh, potentially disadvantage them in the, in the broader marketplace. Uh, I think you know, ethics in general is supposed to provide resources for lawyers to be able to resist powerful clients. And I think that the problem on the ethics side is that the rules are just too vague relative to the fundamental values that uh, lawyers should adhere to. And so there's too much wiggle room that allows for positions to be taken that will adhere to what clients want in ways that may not align with the values that we want to promote through the tax system. And so I think strengthening the ethics rules to create more safe harbors, I think as Amparo was suggesting is a really critical feature. Thank you. Elaine and then Henry. 
Yeah, I mean, what we found um, in work that we did with tax practitioners um, in Ireland and the UK, now, granted, there's a bit more of a, I think, a, an emphasis on tax work being done by accountants in Ireland and the UK, but we did find a confusion around whether there was any role for ethics uh, within tax practice. And when we began to talk to them about ta ethics, they would move into talking about risk management. So risk management seemed to be the big thing. You know, they're like, well, you know, we make sure we have all the right things signed, you know, for taking on a client and we've got money laundering documentation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was like those regulations were sort of controlling the environment so that their ethical issues shouldn't necessarily happen if you've got the right clients and they've got all their documents and so on. But that to me is a very narrow way of defining um, ethics. And I think certainly within the big firms, they have so much of a hierarchy, so many regulations and policies and values, partners and you know all the rest, that to some degree, it takes the agency away from individual practitioners. If they have an issue, they may go to whoever is responsible for that. And what we found in, in our research was that meant that individual practitioners practitioners didn't almost get the exposure or the experience of having to deal with these issues themselves they were handed over maybe to a different division which is probably not good for education or for culture whereas in smaller firms individuals had to kind of just cope on a case-by-case -case basis and that allowed them the exposure for example to their own cases as Jens is saying and um, so I think there's definitely an education piece and a culture within the organization piece that has to happen that shouldn't be hemmed in by just risk management procedures because that doesn't do enough, I think. Thank you. Henry. Yeah, just uh, uh, adding on to what Elaine said, um, you know, the, the larger firms have those checks and balances in place. And there's a bit of a safety net, I think, uh, working in a larger firm where uh, you uh, can say, look, we we have a, a an independent board. They've evaluated this particular proposal and therefore uh, they've ruled against it and therefore we can't move forward. Uh, the smaller practitioner doesn't have that. Uh, that And uh, th there is clearly, they're on the front line. They're going to be the ones who are going to be potentially exposed to uh, either uh, censure or investigation by the professional association regulatory authorities, but they also face the, the problem of um, not uh, the word I'm looking for, uh, having a uh, a reaction from the client where they do not pursue something, uh, and there's a, a potential professional liability uh, lawsuit uh, as a result of that, or they do pursue something, and then the client um, sometimes doesn't always remember that they were told certain things uh, about this might be the ultimate outcome. So that is a challenge too. Henry, I'm reminded one of my uh, ethics panel colleagues I regularly work with is always saying, I'm writing it down. I told you, client, this was the right thing. This was the path. This was what was going to happen. So exactly yeah. that. If it's never, if it's not written down, the conversation never happened, right? It didn't exist, yeah. Well, you know, I guess one of the things I kind of come back around is to the extent we are describing uh enhancing and supporting a culture of discussion of these kinds of problems and questions. Um, you know, uh, yes, it may vary. The, the ease of that happening, say, within a firm may vary a little bit depending on the size. And we're bumping up against a framing of risk management, which, which you definitely do here all the time. Um, what is it you can imagine doing with the professional rules um, and the ethical rules that would sort of help encourage support force, um, you know, firms to sort of more directly, you know, engage um, with that kind of thinking and those kinds of questions. Where, how could the rules themselves or the professional organizations actually, um, you know, provide that additional, either it's a nudge or it's more than a nudge or a frame or, you know, what, what is it you might imagine being changes to the rules that could be helpful in this direction? Any of those questions, really. Well, maybe you could try to change the uh, lose-lose scenario 
Uh, because if you are unethical, you get punished. And if you uh, don't want to be unethical, then you lose your client or you don't make your professional career. So uh, either uh, path, it's wrong uh, for professional development. Uh, but if you try to in, induce an ethical behavior, uh, then you don't get any reward. Uh, so maybe uh, some sort, uh, maybe not not much alone. Uh, uh, bigger incentive should be uh, given uh, to show that having the opportunity to uh, behave differently, you maximize uh, a positive impact on, on society. I, I know it's very difficult to do this in practice, but. Uh, Otherwise, you don't have options, uh, really. <laughs> Thank you. You know, interesting, I, when you were saying lose, lose, I wasn't sure. I was thinking that maybe you were headed down the line of saying, in theory, it's lose, lose. You lose your reputation or lose your client, but that you don't really lose your reputation because um, the, the professional organizations are not enforcing as strictly or the IRS isn't, you know, the government isn't enforcing as strictly uh, against practitioners. So I wasn't sure whether that was where you were headed, but but I, I <laughs> many options here. Um, so uh, next I had Jens and then Scott. Um, during our outreach activities, we have uh, uh, learned a lot about different legal frameworks, jurisdictions and approaches. So we, we, we found jurisdictions where we have uh, very detailed professional rules and we have others where we have only some principles. But our observation is that in the tricky situation, it is very important, and coming back to the same point, to have practical educational material where such situations, such dilemmas you mentioned earlier, are described, are real cases, and not in abstract. You're perfectly right, big firms, uh, law firms, accounting firms have their education programs, their tick boxing exercises, which is great and important. I'm not saying that it's not important, but my experience is that having these, these, these films, these educational material, which on a very didactical manner are, are showing such real cases. I think that is where young people, where students at university and, and uh, practitioners, young practitioners are learning. And I think there is sometimes in some jurisdictions, I'm not saying everyone and, and don't want to to, to say that any uh, of the representatives here, but th there's a, a big possibility to enhance the application of, of such um, case stories and, and uh, problematic situations, how to act, how to make team discussions and, and et cetera. Well, you know, before um, uh, turning to you, Scott, I think I'll just jump in, Jens, and say, you know, um, over the years, um, some of my uh, colleagues who join me sort of on tax ethics panels, but are all lawyers, um, we actually frequently uh, point our audiences in the US to the AICPA uh, statements and examples because they tend to provide a bit more context, a little bit more concrete. It's not that you can cover every single scenario. So that's not what you're ever gonna get. That, that you'd be chasing it for infinity. Um, but we found that there's a way in which the guidance that's been offered um, through the AICPA tends to have that additional uh, granularity that just advances the conversation more than sometimes what our uh, colleagues get through the ABA, the, the legal professional side. So I, I, we've really seen that. I see an example also very good beside AICPA, ICAW has very good uh, training materials which are appropriate for, for, for people to, to use, in, uh, to Henry's point, in smaller firms, to be used in smaller firms, smaller practitioners as an educational program. Scott. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, on the ABA side and on the state level bar regulation side, I mean, I think there are a couple of uh, issues that are potentially um, ones that could be strengthened in terms of the way that the system is is, is, uh, is currently structured. 
And so one, one is a bleeding over, I think, of kind of norms of advocacy and zealousness in terms of position taking relative to clients into the realm of uh, advising clients on you know, regulatory compliance. And I think that the rules themselves don't um, make that boundary line very uh, clear. And so um, you can take aggressive positions in advocacy, but when you're presenting information um, to regulatory agencies, I mean, the, the norms are more uh, oriented around uh, presenting meritorious claims and positions that are going to comply with systemic values. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I think sort of that the bar could do a better job, sort of defining the different domains, um, and also making clear that in the regulatory and advising domain, um, the sort of systemic values part of it is is really uh, more more important than the than the loyalty and zealousness part. I know that this bleeds over in tax practice because sometimes things are presented to the IRS in, in ways that might anticipate litigation and so loyalty concerns become really important. But I think that's you know that's one uh, potential area of clarification where <clears throat> There could be a stronger emphasis in the in the rules itself on uh, systemic values in particular kinds of regulatory context. I'll also just say, in terms of enforcement, the bar, generally speaking, does a really um, poor job enforcing judge <laughs> rules generally, but but in particular rules that are designed to promote systemic values. So if you look at enforcement of issues like um, lawyer compliance with rules to promote the administration of justice, and which which would apply to a lot of the regulatory lawyer in the bar basically never enforces that as an independent value. And so ramping up enforcement on the rules that are in existence could also do a, a lot of work in towards advancing a kind of greater compliance with uh, with the with the values of the of the tax system overall. Daniel. Yeah, I would like to see the American Bar Association strengthen the distinction uh, between efficacy and advising, as Scott's pointing out. But in particular, when you go to the advising part of the ABA rules, rules of professional conduct, it's not very clear or direct as to just how much uh, societal obligation you have and, and a bit of editing in there and a bit of strengthening the language and maybe making it a little bit more granular uh, could, could could provide some additional coverage and, and understanding and, and move the bar a little bit on the ethical conduct of uh, tax advising or compliance advising in general. I thought I might also just uh, briefly uh, share a, an, an anecdote that I, uh, Oh, a few years back, I, I went to a, a training for a week uh, in, on, in, for compliance officers, uh, and it turns out that there's more compliance officers now uh, privately employed in ma major corporations than there are uh, than there are police. Uh, so it's a huge industry, uh, and I'm I was the only academic in the room. Uh, most of the people are in their mid 40s and they're being trained to be compliance officers, and I just was kind of curious as to what they were told. Uh, and it was all about trying to uh, direct. Uh, uh, subordinates to follow rules to further the organizational interests, which struck to me as being economics. It didn't strike me to be in ethics. Nonetheless, the uh, nonetheless the, the name of the thing was ethics and compliance uh, organization. And I asked at the very beginning, had some very sophisticated presenters. Uh, there was a chief compliance officer from Shell Oil uh, there that was a very sophisticated person and, 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 a, and a banker from Wall Street, uh, also very sophisticated. And I asked him at the very beginning, are we ever going to talk about about uh, malfeasance in the C-suite, or is it all about malfeasance of subordinates? And they said, well, we'll, we'll get to that uh, during the week. And then at the end of the week, I pointed out, you know, we never did get to the C-suite. Uh, it, it was all about, uh, about directing subordinates. But I, I thought that was, um, for me, enlightening as to what, what actually is, what kind of training people get when they're called compliance officers. It's, it's a lot about financial risk management, and that's about it. Yeah, no, and, and that wraps back around to what Elaine was saying about, you know, it's uh, a, a, not quite the ethics calculus we thought. Uh, Mary. Yeah, I I, uh, I I really love this conversation. And I feel like in terms of um, what can we do in terms of regulation, I think it's important to talk about, at least in the United States, there have been many efforts repeated over the past couple of years to pass a law called the Enablers Act. And with all due respect to Carlos, I look at enablers very differently than you do. I think you are enabling um, tax evasion um, and tax underpayment. So what that does, and it's a kind of regulation that I think by definition will step up the ethics game, which is suggesting that 
at least for purposes of um, anti-money laundering um, and the Bank Secrecy Act, the U.S. law that requires financial institutions to know their customers and make sure that they are monitoring and making sure that we don't have um, terrorist finances and, and we're, you know, facilitating child um, trafficking, human trafficking. So, but that act is saying we want to just not just hold the financial institutions responsible, we want to hold the accountants, the lawyers, the folks that are behind the scenes uh, responsible as well. I think it's going to take the passage of an equivalent of an enablers act as to tax to get people to be serious about their um, ethics. Um, I think there's nothing that um, makes you more aware when you are potentially on the line. So, you know, the kleptocracy caucus and Congress, the US Congress has been pushing this bill and externalities like the, you know, the new shift in journalism where the ICIJ is collaborating with um, or uh, newspapers like Sedoitsche Zeitig and BuzzFeed News who bring us things like the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers. Uh, those are the sorts of things that are driving this move for legislation. So I would argue it needs to come from outside. Um, and luckily, investigative journalism is alive and well. And luckily, um, leakers, um, folks who turned over clearly the files from the Mossack von Seca law firm, um, are what drove this. I'm sure that that is um, provocative, Carlos. I'm trying to be provocative back to you. Um, so I would love to see an enablers act aimed at tax accountants and equivalent. And that really does sort of touch upon when I was asking Amparo sort of, you know, indirectly, is it is it is the attention that we might want to see directed towards ethics going to come more from penalties and risks to the advisors than it is through inspirational? I mean, it hopefully will be both. Um, and you need to have the frame there, the intellectual and sort of ethical frame for them to turn to and remind them this is, in fact, what we're holding you to. And it's that failure that uh, will come back uh, to haunt you. But, but you know, which side is going to push and pull more? Uh, Jens? Um, I'm, I fully agree with your observation uh, that both uh, directions are important. Uh, I just want to, uh, to, to bring to attention that the European Commission just uh, finished a consultation on enabling, um, which uh, in a quite, I would say, rude manner, um, criticizes the profession. And I think that's reality. And, and, and that's why I think, and it's not only about tax advisors, it's about everyone doing tax advice. I'm not saying that the questions and the answers are fully uh, consistent and 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 conceptually uh, uh, good uh, and and concise, but I think that's reality. Where in this case a, 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 a European uh, initiative is, is 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 started, and it is questioned whether there is enough regulation on the professional side, or whether the states, the member states, should act in a certain manner. I think. That is very important uh, from the professional side because we are always thinking in our professional organizations, which are great, and I'm very supportive on, on self-regulation. But I think there is an issue of transparency, of trust, and perception, uh, which we have to consider. Whether it's true or wrong, perception is reality, uh, even though we are not sharing this perception. Um, and I think the profession has to think about how to involve these stakeholders in future structures. That's my personal view, uh, just to, to, to keep the self-regulation, to keep as much as possible the profession in, in, in the driver's seat, but to, to add something where the trust into the, the, the system is enhanced. Thank you. And I see that coming up. Um... You know, when we, in our next round table, move more into the gray zone, I think we'll be picking up on a lot of those themes. Um, Scott, uh, you had your hand up, and then I had a question I wanted to turn to next. Yeah, the thing I would add to that, I mean, it, it, it strikes me is that it's it's uh, all hands on deck, both and. Um, and one of the interesting things uh, about the um, sort of mobilization against the Trump lawyers was that a lot of the 
kind of enforcement energy came from outside of the bar itself and civil society organizations that were filing ethics complaints um, and really putting pressure and using the media to spotlight bar and uh, regulatory enforcement gaps and you know wondering if that kind of outside influence but targeted at the bar is also something that could be mobilized in relationship to uh, in, 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 in relationship to, to tax compliance and the role of lawyers. Yeah, Scott, and I think that actually relates. Um, someone had mentioned earlier the sort of maybe Elaine, it was you, the expansion of NGOs in the tax area into the tax area more. And although that you know that's not necessarily the specific group you were thinking of in the Trump context, but that idea of looking beyond government, looking beyond uh, the professional uh, regulating organizations. Um, but to you know, to sort of others in society to sort of be the mover on that. Um, I wanted to turn. So one of our uh, organizers for today, uh, Stephen Holden, um, had a question that uh, he was going to put to the panel. So Stephen, I'll turn it over to you. Many thanks. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion, especially with kind of the first part and the second. I think turn into what Mary said a few minutes ago uh, regarding possibly like the old the interplay between the different kind of um, uh, roles that contribute to tax avoidance. I think that's been quite interesting in the UK we've seen uh, an abuse of slap suits, especially from our former chancellor in terms of uh, tax professionals who were investigating him and he ended up you know paying a five million pound uh, tax bill um, which we're, uh, um, we're not allowed to call evasion. Um, but turning to the idea of the professionals and their role in enforcement, in the UK we in from 2017 we had the um, uh, the offence of the failure to prevent, so the failure to prevent uh, fraud. And what they're looking to do is now implement that again uh, in a kind of a stronger aspect in a new um, economic and corporate crime transparency bill that's currently going through Parliament. However, between 20, uh, 2016 and 2021, the Serious Fraud Office has investigated or, or they've brought 168 prosecutions. Only five have been successfully prosecuted. So my question would be, even when we have this kind of failure to prevent offence, when it's on the statute, when it's on the books, is it going to be meaningful in terms of transforming ethics, changing organisational culture, changing how these different individuals interact with each other? If in reality, it's just not enforced, if there aren't the resources, if there's not the manpower, and if there's not the will behind it. Mary, did you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, uh, I certainly um, think that, that that record for the SFO speaks volumes, and this gets to a theme that, that we've been discussing all day today, is what really is perceived by taxpayers as the threat that they're going to be audited or prosecuted. Um, and you combine what Stephen is saying, that we don't have a failure to prevent offense yet in the UK. The SFO has not had success in a lot of their prosecutions. And then you combine that across the pond back in the United States with an, uh, a consistent effort to gut the staffing of the IRS. <laughs> That's the backdrop against which... Um, tax professionals are operating is that um, people are aware that there may not be enough people. They're already understaffed. And we did see the Biden administration, and we have to say that, to, to beef up the spending there. But there's a constant battle. Um, and it's currently under attack by the Republicans in the House to, you know, uh, deal with the staffing. So I think the facts on the ground are very good to think about um, what's the likelihood you're going to be prosecuted. And where are the resources in these, um, you know, the disparity and inequality of arms between the government's resources and some of these big taxpayers? Carlos. I pick up the glove from Mary's challenge. And uh, my main intervention here will be twofold. First of all, when I, when I say that um, tax professionals are enablers of the rule of law, what I try to highlight is their role in fostering compliance, in fostering full compliance of all parties involved in the tax relationship with the rule of law. We should not forget that our systems are 
supposedly strongly based on on the empire of the law the compliance of the law and the law draws a line that should not be passed by anyone not only by tax professionals but also by the state the state has also boundaries and the state has also limits in 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 the ways and, and the forms it can pursue the public interest you you cannot just hold the public interest as as the as the uh carte blanche sorry for my very very poor french um to do to do whatever they please it it's not amparo pointed it out earlier in the in the first panel it's not about more revenue it's not about just criminalizing or as as uh, Guta Jacobs mentioned in other contexts to policificate tax law and, and and use tax law as a tool for um, let me look for for a, a suffer word than the one I'm thinking of but let's let's go for it and, and to terrorize honest taxpayers into doing things the state way. This is a balance. There is a balance that needs to be achieved between the positions of both, of both parties. And that leads me to uh, the question uh, Stephen puts forward. Thank you very much for your question, Stephen. I think that the problem here is, is a matter of the actual effectiveness of the tools we, we want to use against this kind of conduct. Criminal law has its boundaries. Criminal law has its limits. You, it's, 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 not, it's not just a, a, a gun you can point at people to do things uh, in, a, in a specific way. I mean, literally a gun. Um, I believe that I'm, I, I haven't read the corporate economic crime and corporate transparency bill, but from my, I'm a tax lawyer. I'm not, I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I'm very interested into criminal law. But from a criminal law perspective, a, a, an offense to failure to prevent something requires some technicalities. And there are some, some uh, benchmarks that need to be fulfilled in order to attribute responsibility to a to someone the guarantor's role and uh, objective in, um, attribution and, and a few things of criminal law that we will not naturally be discussing here but the thing is these are our technical uh, requirements that are in nature are difficult to fulfill it's not it's not that you can you can point fingers at anyone and say okay you did not uh, prevent fraud offense because for, for you to be in a position to actually prevent fraud uh, offense in, in a criminal criminally liable for not preventing a fraud offense, you need to be in a position in, in, in which you actually have what Ger the Germans, Professor Rotin, uh, called the dominion on the organization and the dominion on the fact that actually leads to the offense. And that's, that's not easy, easily achievable, particularly in the economic context. There are a few shortcomings of the tools that we use to, to act against tax avoidance and tax fraud. And that's, that's undeniable, precisely. That's why the second round table is, is around the, this gray, immense gray area that involves particularly giving tax advice in this in this particular context and ethics in itself is somehow a gray area if it if it was so clear white and black what was right and what was wrong a a rule-based approach would be easier to to curb it would be have things easier to curb uh this this kind of conduct that that as Jens very rightfully said and I fully agree with him I'll move to approach on a case by case basis. I'll, 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 I'll borrow the words of professors uh, Hart and Dorkin. I would say, let's let's remember that these are hard cases. These are not easy cases. These are, these are not things that can be drawn black and white into a piece of paper. So codes of ethics are obviously of utmost importance to, to address these kind of issues. 
But we need to bear in mind two things. One, they in itself are not enough, are naturally not enough. And secondly, and I'll borrow, uh, I'll, I'll take advantage of the, of the presence of many Americans within the panel. Uh, do you guys remember there was this advertising of the Chicago White Sox in 1991? Back back when they changed their uniforms back to from red, white, and blue to black, and they they put this ad saying "Good guys wear black." Remember that? Okay. Touch professionals, even as they can be seen as the bad guys and and the guys wearing black hats, can also be good guys. There are good guys in the tax profession. There are bad guys in the tax profession. So so. Pointing fingers at them, as the European Commission appears to be doing through through their documentation, is is I, I don't want to take this too long, but I, I think it's rather dangerous. All right, I want to pick up on two pieces. Of that one, just a comment to to put out, um, and the other is to kind of circle back to whistleblowers for a moment because of response. Um, uh, that we've had here from a couple people and, and sort of pushing more on whistleblowers as a direction. So the one thing that just at the end of your remarks, Carlos, I just wanted to sort of think about, um, you know, was this idea uh, you, you were responding to, you know, whether it was inappropriate, unfair, or not helpful for um, tax professionals sort of be highlighted and critiqued. And I guess one question, just to have as our backdrop, you know, to what extent, extent does the unique expertise and in some sense privileged position of tax advisors um, put on them uh, some type of different or higher ethical expectation? So I'm just gonna put that aside just to think about, but but that was a question that occurred to me as you were um, as you were speaking. I think coming back around to whistleblowing, you know, if we're hearing that we would like ethical rules to inspire tax advisors, but there are lots of limits to that inspiration. Um, we would like professional organizations to have the kinds of training and guides that uh, lead uh, tax advisors down the right path, but there are sort of been some practical limits to that success. Uh, and criminal charges have not always been a, a path to really um, uh, ensuring the behavior we'd like to see. So it brings me back around to thinking about whistleblowing. And so a number of different questions I have, and, and maybe Mary, I'll start with you, but pick out which one you want to start with. You know, what changes would we want to see to whistleblowing statutes that would move us in the right direction? If the question is the role of tax professionals, whistleblowers can be thought of as doing multiple things, but but to the extent that their role can help um, support directly, indirectly, or through threats, the, the role of tax professionals, you know, what kind of changes would we like to see there? And is it that we're thinking about the tax professionals as whistleblowers, the tax professionals as the ones at risk from whistleblowers, but in any direction, sort of your thoughts on that, Barry? Yeah, I mean, I thank you. I think um, whistleblowers are the wild card, right? Um, and very helpfully so in terms of um, people who think that there's only a 1% chance they'll be audited, don't know that there's a wild card out there that now, not just in the United States, and it's important, there's a perception that it's only the Americans who have offices of the whistleblower within their various tax authorities. There are other countries, including Canada has an offshore tax informant program. The UK has a discretionary reward program for whistleblowers. Uh, South Korea has a 50 year old program. So the whistleblower wild card and empowering whistleblowers um, is something that's not just that the United States does. So I think tax professionals are, are I think that the safest place to start is by saying, uh, having them be targets of whistleblower information um, is probably the best place to start. Tax cheats are slippery. Um, and it's very difficult to catch them. And when you don't have the audit resources to audit from the outside, there's no substitute for a well-placed insider who can reveal this information. So I think I would start from a place that we in the United States have had a longstanding relationship with these kinds of whistleblower programs. The IRS program um, has been around since 2006. It's got some pretty impressive statistics. 
Um, uh, since 2007, the IRS has recovered $6.4 billion as a result of information provided by whistleblowers. It's paid over 2,500 rewards, financial rewards to whistleblowers, totaling more than $1.05 billion. So this is a 16-year history. It has inspired in the United States, um, the states of New York, um, the District of Columbia, um, Illinois, and um, Maryland, and other states to actually follow suit and protect their um, uh, taxpayer revenue um, by empowering whistleblowers to come to them. The New York's, state of New York's False Claims Act, um, which has the longest standing program outside of um, the IRS program, has recovered over $460 million in tax-related proceeds as a result of whistleblowers. So I think it's important to just start with the baseline before we figure out how do we fix it. Um, I think we need to talk about the trend, which is that success begets success, and the success of the IRS program has inspired many states um, and also other foreign governments to take a similar approach um, in recognizing the incredible role that whistleblowers can play in uh, bringing information forward. If people are interested, I think two of the most exciting developments are that the District of Columbia um, recently within the past year adopted um, a section to their False Claims Act that al allows them to um, let whistleblowers bring information about tax fraud and, and, and not just bring a tip, but actually launch a lawsuit in the name of the government. Um, and there's a case folks should be watching against um, a, a big exec named Michael Saylor in the District of Columbia. Um, he's been accused by the AG of, of DC for evading $25 million in income taxes. Um, he basically claiming he lived in Florida when a lot of things on social media and some whistleblowers were able to show that um, they believe he actually lived in a less advantageous tax jurisdiction, which is the D DC. Um, New York False Claims Act, another big case, uh, 100, they, the AG got $105 million uh, fraud settlement um, as a result of a whistleblower initiated False Claims Act case against another massive executive, Tom Sandell, and his asset management company. Um, for a scheme to avoid um, recognizing $450 million in offshore income. So I point to that, that it's not just a federal game in the United States, it's very much trickled down to the states. Um, and I expect that it is something, the prospect that um, if you are a federal and state taxpayer in New York, um, the likelihood of you being audited goes up a lot higher when Law firms like mine are incentivized um, and are contingency fee based to get these people in front of as confidential informants, in essence, in front of the regulators. And basically, we prevent, present them with cake in a box. We give them the smoking gun documents that allow them uh, to hopefully bring these cases. So I do feel like it's a game changer. I'm happy to talk more about how we can fix um, the existing programs because they are not a panacea and the IRS program in particular takes more than 11 years on average to pay a reward to a whistleblower and that can be demoralizing <laughs> to someone who's um, um, undertaken the professional risks, risks to speak up. So I think it's it's a, certainly a trend, a phenomenon, um, and one that I think folks should consider uh, a regulatory body should consider in terms of its potential effectiveness. Thank you, Mary. I actually have a, a follow-up question, but I just wanted to note that Robert um, had put in sort of our notes um, that uh, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights is hearing a case um, on points related to what Mary was describing, Hallett v. Luxembourg. Um, and so seeing some of these issues um, outside the U.S. as well. Um, I think before I, we have several questions from the audience I wanted to weave in, in in just a moment, but before doing that, I just wanted to tie in a little bit more something, uh, Mary, that you had raised about whistleblowers. So I'm just gonna directly come back to you on it um, and ask the question, if we're thinking about uh, whistleblower statutes and the impact of whistleblower statutes from the lens of the tax advisors specifically, what, at least, you know, from your experience, perception to date, um, where is it 
actually hitting the tax advisor? Is it that it's now part of the risk assessment you're putting forth to the client so that as you are thinking through with the client, the range of actions they may or may not take, um, and this is almost almost a piece of the audit lottery, so to speak, kind of is woven in that way and sort of shifts with the risk calculus and, and sort of in that way impacts the tax advisor and the advice that's ultimately given and taken. Um, or is it somehow direct personal risk, uh, reputational risk, you know, secondary suits or, or issues that you as the tax advisor face? So where is it actually hitting the tax advisor most? Yeah, I think it hits them very much in both places. I mean, you can look at and you think about a number of scandals. Um, we can't think about Wirecard without thinking about the role that um, uh, I think it was PwC or EY and played in it. I mean, the certain frauds now, including um, are synonymous with, with the accountancy firms um, and their tax advisory practices that go along with it. So there's incredible risk that's posed um, to tax professionals by to the brand by their affiliation with certain of these types of frauds. I mean, you just look at the Trump indictment of the Trump organization has caused Mazars, their accountancy, tax accountancy firm to fire them, right? So I think those risks um, increase um, and are considerable. Um, so it is something that tax advisors, I think, consider. To your first point, in terms of risk mitigation, I think a lot of people um, have the false perception that whistleblowers um, immediately, because there's a carrot in the form of a potential reward, will immediately go external to the regulators um, without trying to resolve the issue internally first. It's, it's just not what we see. Um, we don't have data for the IRS, but for the SEC, 84% of the whistleblowers who um, receive rewards under the SEC program reported internally first. So I think it's really important that we don't um, overemphasize or outstate the, um, the risk in terms of whistleblowers will statistically try and tell you about the problem and have it corrected internally before they um, you know, sabotage their careers. Um, they're loyal as to, to a, you know, overwhelmingly loyal to the organization and they want, they don't want to sideline their careers. So in terms of risk management, and ethics, I would say that my biggest uh, advice to people on this call in the profession is to start reconsidering who whistleblowers are and take our bias of seeing them from childhood as snitches who get stitches and land in ditches to be thinking more about maybe some of your most loyal, not disloyal employees. They're the ones who are willing to speak the hard truths um, at great risk to themselves. So I do think the risk management analysis is one that tax professionals have to consider. But I think one of the things tax professionals can and should be doing um, in an ethics type of cap capacity is retraining themselves on how to receive information from people who are speaking up. They don't have to be whistleblowers. I often say whistleblowers are made by the organization. A lot of my clients don't think of themselves as whistleblowers. Uh, they're just doing their job and they're made into whistleblowers by how their information is received. So hope that kind of answers the question. Jens, I saw you had something. I just want to add, there is there are two types of whistleblowing lines. One is these which are introduced by legislation, which you, uh, Mary, uh, mentioned. But I think uh, as a good part of a quality management system in each and every firm, that should be a, a, a system of whistleblowing and internal uh, at the first step, um, that you are able to, to get the information in the system and that in the system of the firms, in the quality management system, you can raise this. And this is something, for example, that's why we have in our proposal too, that uh, the, the, the professional accountant, whether in business or in public practice, is uh, uh, should be motivated to use these lines. And if there are no lines, I think that is something for the professional bodies to discuss which best practices, if, if not uh, 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 regulated by law, uh, which best practices should be established in, in professional uh, tax advising firms. Because on the other side, 
um, if nothing is happening. And I think that is a background for the European consultation. It said always the client are punished. And what is with the advisors? I, th I, I know that is a very provocative uh, um, term mentioned by the European Commission, but th this is a perception. And having an, an own whistleblower compliance management system, I think is a huge advantage in a, in a discussion on such cases. For example, if you're looking at Cum-Ex, which is a German case, I just want to highlight, and it's a, it's a case for lawyers, it's a case for uh, banks, it's a, a case for, for, for clients. There, you see that very early inside the structures, the law firms, there were doubts, but they were not reported to the right people, I would say. Thank you, Jens. Uh, Scott. You know, from the ethics side, this is one area where, um, back to the question of what changes might promote more uh, robust ethical behavior on the part of the lawyers as gatekeepers, um, you know, there are rules that permit whistleblowing, uh, that require it internally and permit it externally. And, you know, one way of thinking about reform that might um, improve the system would be to mandate the external disclosure in situations in which lawyers um, have reason to, to believe that their clients' uh, uh, tax submissions are going to uh, be uh, criminal or fraudulently uh, submitted. And those are situations now where if lawyer services are used in, the, um, in, in, in advancing uh, those, those kinds of uh, criminal or, or fraudulent activities, they may disclose confidential information but are not required to. Um, and there had been a lot of debate about whether this should be a mandatory as opposed to a discretionary rule. A mandatory rule would uh, up the ante, would give protection to lawyers who wanted to do the right thing but might worry about um, professional consequences. Um, and you know, it still it still relates to the broader question of what happens in terms of um, the legal profession as a whole, kind of ceding responsibility to other actors in the system that might be willing to cut corners. But it would take the question of um, of, of individual uh, discretion off the table in a way that I think could be very positive. Mary, I didn't know if you, you were- um, Yeah, no, I did. I did want to respond and I think Scott's idea is a great one. We do actually have an analog in the UK where in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, the UK um, parliament responded by adopting um, something called the senior managers regime that basically puts an affirmative obligation on senior managers to report certain types of wrongdoing um, after they've reported internally and if nothing happened. The fear I have with mandatory reporting is it forces someone to become a whistleblower and burn themselves. Um, and so, um, I think mandatory reporting is great if we believe and have faith that the regulator is going to do something with it, but in a way it can create the worst case scenario for my clients, which is forcing them out to become a whistleblower. Um, that inevitably makes its way back to the organization and they become um, blocklisted. I don't like to use the term blacklisted, but blocklisted. Um, so while I think it's laudable, I do think there, there are downsides to it. And what we've seen with the senior managers regime in the UK is that it's required these people to come forward. And sadly, the Financial Conduct Authority really hasn't acted on the information. And we've actually observed that it's actually had the perverse effect of sending these whistleblowers to the United States to the extent that there are um, as a nexus and, and jurisdiction for the US authorities, because there's more of a sense that the US authorities will act on the information. Um, thank you. I want to turn to some questions now from um, the audience, but I did want to, you know, thinking about your point, Mary, about the uh, the risks to the whistleblower, whether under the basic regime or certainly under sort of a forced uh, participation system, um, you know, whether, you know, how that situation could be reimagined to sort of um, also reinvigorate ethics within the, um, the accounting practices of law firm. So the idea of, you know, what would it mean if I'm a law firm or a big accounting firm and I hire a whistleblower? Like I make a big point. So-and-so was a, you know, an established whistleblower, major work. We are now bringing them on board. And if that were the kind of cultural shift where that was a, considered a impressive thing to do, a desirable thing to do, um, you know, you know, 
could we imagine that? What would that look like? What would that do? So just kind of as a, a you know a thought on on sort of uh, what you've identified there are some major risks, Mary. So not not yeah. saying we're seeing it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's no better virtue signaling that you're serious about whistleblowers and receiving their information um, than actually hiring um, folks who are known to be whistleblowers. We've seen a very few corporations do that. Uh, Thompson's Reuters um, hired as their chief compliance office or a well-known uh, whistleblower, and but they're very it's few and far between. Um, but I think it is it is a really good first step um, in terms of changing the mindset of who whistleblowers are. Um, they're your risk management tools. They're not disloyal. Just if I could jump back. Oh, oh sorry, on yeah. the lawyer oh, cool. on the on the lawyer side. I think Mary raises important points. I mean, one way of thinking about the mandatory versus discretionary um, issue is that um, mandatory does create risk for people that are in the, you know, in the crosshairs of that, but also it gives leverage in discussions with clients if you're able to say, look, you know, I have to do this and it's going to come out unless you do the right thing. I think that can be a resource that's very powerful and, you know, it does have some downside risks, but the risk of the current system are that no one does anything because there are no consequences for staying silent. Thank you. Uh, I was gonna now turn to some of our questions. And, and so uh, one of our um, audience members made an observation, then a question, I'll do the observation first, which is it kind of links a little bit with our first panel and, and sort of uh, the degree to which vague and or complicated tax rules um, in some ways are a component of Know, sort of the the ethical problem, right? More opportunities are put in front. You know, it it's one thing if your client says, yes, it's absolutely clearly income and I'm going to hide it. All right, that's one problem. Um, but it's what we've talked about a lot are, are you know, more complicated scenarios. Uh, and part of that comes from complicated tax rules. So, you know, there is that that um, idea that if we could simplify, um, that may help. Well, I, you know, um, lots of reasons we haven't simplified. Don't see that in the U.S. coming forward, but certainly an issue. Um, the question, though, that um, we had in this um, uh, from this participant: uh, Should professionals participate more often in meetings with law enforcement agencies for the purpose of identifying possible loopholes in the legislation, given their specific knowledge of the issue? So, in some sense, it's not quite my earlier general question to you all. You know, do, do tax professionals' unique expertise and privileged position justify a, a higher ethical expectation? But at least more, they have clearly the knowledge. Should they be regularly participating more with the government and identifying those weaker spots in the system? Would that be something you all see as useful, helpful? Not sufficiently broad. Henry and then Daniel. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, speaking from uh, the uh, professional accountants aspect, uh, you know, there there is an advocacy aspect of the work that we do in responding to uh, the IRS when proposed regulations are issued. Uh, I know the ABA does also. Uh, in issuing comment letters and identifying unclear uh, or challenging aspects of the proposed regulations. Um, you know, certainly there are uh, oftentimes hearings, uh, congressional hearings, subcommittee hearings uh, on certain proposed legislation, but oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, so much legislation is passed as part of a larger bill and, you know, uh, our congressional representatives are um, basically given 48 hours to uh, review a thousand page document and then are expected to vote on. It. Uh, and that's a fundamental problem with the system uh, itself. Uh, so clearly the complexity uh, it, it plays into the challenge of uh, correct interpretation. Uh, and you know, when there is a measured approach, to legislation, I think it can be beneficial, but uh, in from a practical standpoint, that doesn't always occur. Daniel. Well, I was just going to comment that uh, 
uh, expertise in lobbying is very much needed. So to the extent that a uh, sensible legislation is going to be passed or, or reformed, uh, you need expertise, but you just got to make sure that all voices are heard. Uh, so if the uh, AACIP is there, the CPA is there, then then we've got people or the ABA is there, then we've got people that are per, at least purportedly looking out for the, the public interest. But to the extent that it's uh, 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 the logic of collective action is, uh, is the people that are most uh, affected by the legislation and the people are going to be speaking up. And if they're the only people that are speaking up, then you're going to get uh, capture of the regulatory process. So, but so, so long as uh, every, everyone's voices are heard, um, then, uh, then lobbying is a good thing. It's just a, the, it's, it's, a, it's a difficulty when not every perspective is, is presented. Um, I want to turn to, oh, Carlos. But I think the question is, is twofold. If we understand professionals participating in meetings with law enforcement or identifying possible loopholes as public consultation, as advice in general terms on how to improve legislation, that's completely fine. That's actually what Amparo said in, in panel number one. And, and I, I, I fully agree and uphold what Henry and, and Daniel just said. But on the other hand, if we think or, or we define these meetings with law enforcement as uh, ways to um, promote that um, tax lawyers come forward, so to speak, with these, the loopholes that being in the bright area are precisely the competitive advantages of tax advisors within the role in, in, in the relevant market, then, then it becomes, this, this particular feature becomes a matter of the judiciary, as uh, Ms. Olson pointed out in panel number one. I think that with those things in which tax, tax um, taxpayers and, and tax professionals and um, tax authorities differ in a particular interpretation of a statute or whichever of which, whichever sort, is the judiciary the one called to to solve the difference? Otherwise, it would be it might become. I'm not saying that it it, it is per se. But it might become a way of policifying tax law and, and erasing the dividing line between the bright area and the dark area by expanding the dark area to an, a, an, a, a region which is, if not bright, undefined, so to speak. I was going to take, before I go to the next question, I was going to sort of uh, pick up on something you said, Carlos, and and ask, well, I guess, consider the uh, the dimension of attorney-client privilege in this, particularly at least for where the tax advisors are an attorney, and, and if they are um, giving guidance, so separate from any duties to report fraud, if they're more giving guidance, uh, identifying weaknesses in legislation or places where it you know, the challenges in the drafting of the legislation or regulations creates ethical dilemmas. Uh, is there some issue with attorney-client privilege? Um, to the extent that honestly, the way I know about this, what makes me an ethic, uh, an expert on this problem is the fact that I have clients uh, with whom I'm experiencing challenges as we work our way through this um, area of rules. Is that, does that pose a problem to me really kind of coming forward and highlighting that for the government. Amparo? Yeah, I would say uh, that uh, it's difficult to simplify tax legislation. I, I remember a quote that uh, I read to my students the other day. Uh, and it was, people think taxation is a terribly mundane subject, but what makes fascinating is that taxation in reality is life. The tax code, once you get to know it, embodies all the essence of life, greed, politics, power, goodness, and charity. Everything is in there. That's why it's so hard to get a simplified tax code. Life just isn't simple. 
And then uh, you realize that uh, motivations and intentions of taxpayers may vary depending on their own situation at the moment in time. And also uh, happens the same with tax advisors. So uh, I, I don't really think it's a problem of solving uh, the consequences of application of the tax rule. Uh, I, I really believe that even if it's hard to simplify it, we have to care for uh, the legislative procedure and the legislative technique and uh, try to anticipate and uh, have better legislation, better tax legislation. So I, I really um, would uh, go for preventative approach instead of uh, uh, addressing the symptoms just only. And uh, here, um, I, I don't think uh, that uh, the, the tools are always uh, the same uh, to be applied. Uh, you, you can have hard law and you can have soft law. And my problem here is uh, the conceptual differences uh, because in every legal order, maybe standards have a different meaning. Uh, so uh, they get to uh, make their way to the legislation and the normative value, sometimes through references that uh, the criminal code, the tax code, the professional code uh, or liability uh, act made to those codes or standards. So uh, that makes a, a bit complicated uh, how to uh, avoid overlappings and put every tool in, in a proper, uh, with a proper way. I mean, I don't know if I'm being cl clear enough, but uh, what I think is that we should be careful because uh, sometimes uh, the tools have different ways to address the problems and they don't have the same significance everywhere. And we could even uh, over-regulating uh, create more problems. Thank you. Uh, Jens, then Carlos. Thank you. I, I, I fully agree uh, with your uh, comments, Ampara. Um, the, the life is complex, so also the legislation uh, is complex. And the profession is involved in, in, in developing the legislation. So in many jurisdictions, they, they give uh, comment letters to, to draft legislation processes. So there is an involvement. But I think uh, uh, the, coming back to the question, uh, uh, the, the, uh, from the audience, I think one key element is transparency. Transparency means for me that um, if a professional uh, is giving an advice, it, had, it has always to be done in a transparent manner. And that means that each and every information you are receiving from your client, whether it's mandatory or voluntarily, you are able to give this full information to the tax authorities, either by a form uh, which is uh, seen for for a certain tax model, or as you see in tax six, where you have to to report certain models to to a tax authority, and I think that is something which is very important. And perhaps even if transparency is not possible under a certain jurisdiction, this test would I be able if I would be able to bring the whole whole case the full information to the tax authority. This is a good text, test for, a, for an ethical approach to a tax advice. Because if it's intransparent, you're going, for, in my perspective, in the gray zone, and then you have to take other, but we, we're talking of the bright zone. So that's why I think transparency is a very, very important element. And this is not in contradiction to the legal privilege. In my understanding as a lawyer, the legal privilege is something which should protect the client in the preparation of, uh, in the thought process. And if there is a criminal situation, how to bring him out of this situation in a proper manner, but not to hide something which has to go transparent. And then Carlos? Well, I think I'll play the devil's advocate 
in a way. <laughs> so so let's let's keep it simple. Um, twofold. Um, I'll pick up on something Amparo just said uh, uh, and, and connected with what Jens just said a, a few moments ago. There is this very interesting article published in a, in a Spanish journal, in Quincena Fiscal, Fortnite, uh, tax fortnight would be the, uh, the translation of that, uh, which states, and, and actually I, I do agree with that position, that the legal professional privilege is a fundamental principle of the rule of law. Is in a Dorkinian perspective, is a double safeguard. It's a safeguard for taxpayers for actually rely on someone to help them achieve all those goals we were mentioning about, we were mentioning in the first panel. Because otherwise it would become harder, if not impossible. Let's think of priests. In order to, to grant, and, and I'll, I'll make a religious uh, reference here, uh, in order to grant salvation to believers, you need to empower priests with the confessional secret. They, 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 they should not reveal what they hear in the sacrament of confession, right? Because otherwise people won't confess. Otherwise, and, and then otherwise people won't be saved in that religious perspective. Vis-a-vis, Likewise, in uh, the legal professional privilege upholds, grants the taxpayer the possibility and, and every citizen the possibility of having within its his, his or her reach the tools to properly address legal issues and to properly conduct him, him or herself through the paths of life. Not, on, not only in judicial, in the in a judicial context, but in the general context of life. And that's actually the, the main role that from an ethical and legal perspective, tax uh, professionals fulfill. And on the other hand, is a the legal professional pri um, professional privilege is a safeguard for tax um, professionals to do have a market in which to develop their services and, and to do to actually have clients to whom they might provide said services as we will be discussing probably in, in panel number three. This minimum standard, so to speak, has been, has been acknowledged by the IBFD Observatory on the protection of taxpayers' rights. And actually um, in, under area three of confidentiality, that means that the legal professional privilege will raise ethical questions without a doubt. That the legal professional privilege may be interpreted in different ways for sure. Let's, let's just take a look at the wide discussion that has been going on since the enactment of DAC6. As long as Article 8 of, of DAC6 Defers to national legislations the definition of what is, is professional privilege. But I, in the line of this paper written by Professor uh, Betty Andrade, I do believe that there is a minimum standard of protection stemming from the legal professional privilege that needs to be upheld in each and every situation. This, and in that regard, and that will be kind of provocative. I do believe that the full transparency policy that Jens has uh, has advocated a few moments ago, it's not real in, in terms of not 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 easily translate translatable into practice. That that's my 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 opinion with all due respect, naturally. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I mean, I think the privilege is fundamentally important. I think, uh, you know, from a U.S. legal standpoint, uh, it's important to rem remember the distinction between privilege and confidentiality, and privilege exists to, to prevent lawyers from having to disclose uh, under compulsion uh, confidential uh, lawyer-client communications. It's much more narrow than confidentiality. Um, you know, one of the interesting developments around privilege has been the kind of recent case that I'm sure many of you have followed, Henry Grand Jury, where 
tax professionals, tax lawyers who are making arguments for an expansive application of the privilege that would apply to dual purpose uh, communications that contain both legal and non-legal advice. Um, and the Supreme Court denied cert in a case from the Ninth Circuit that adopted a more narrow reading of it that only applied the privilege to legal advice. And so there's a bunch of stuff that's out there that's in the nature of kind of business advice and tax compliance that do doesn't necessarily implicate the pri privilege at all. So I think that's kind of important to understand, particularly when you're thinking about interfacing between lawyers and regulatory agencies. And on the confidentiality side, confidentiality does sweep much more broadly and it, and, and it does prevent lawyers from uh, talking about any facts related to the representation, but there are, are also exceptions to that to the rules of confidentiality, and and some of them um, do uh, relate to uh, the need for lawyers to secure legal advice about their own compliance with the rules, um, and always obviously can get exceptions from their clients to talk to uh, regulatory agents in in order to make sure that the clients are doing the right thing. Um. I wanted to, as I mentioned, I turn uh, weave back into some of the comments or questions from our our um, our audience, and and one um, person put forward the sort of possibility as we're thinking about um, uh, different ways to build sort of a, a role of systemic values um, and think about different institutions and what their part in all this is. Um, they offered the idea: would it help if uh, compl the compliance legal framework were expanded um, so as to include as part of the risks that need to be identified and mitigated um, ones that are related to tax avoidance and aggressive tax planning. So not just your sort of um, anti-money laundering type risks or other illegal activities, that it would also include a risk assessment of potential unethical behavior. So I'm not going to raise that sort of as question, but just to put that out there, sort of another, you know, sort of layer in terms of um, either places and parties who would be building these questions into um, their planning. So we have uh, just a little bit of time left, and I wanted to bring us back around squarely to ethics um, and how that fits into, the, and how the tax advisor's own ethics fit into uh, advice giving. Uh, and it relates a little bit to some question that we had in the first session. I said we'd come back and, and emphasize a bit more. Um, and so this is the way I'd put it. Um, a number of years ago, I was on a tax ethics panel in the U.S. And we picked as our theme for that particular panel discussion um, the question of how can the lawyers or to what degree uh, can and should a lawyer's own ethics direct their tax advice, guide, shape, direct their tax advice. And so this was, the, and it was an hour of just pure argument. Um, it was massive disagreement, but it was uh, framed, I think, in the following way. Do we use our ethics, is, is the only way we can make an ethical argument uh, essentially to identify risks. So I have my own ethical guidance, whether it's coming from the practice, uh, you know, from my from my experience, from my professional regulating body, from my sense of duty to the system, my sense of duty to society, whatever it is, um, is the only way I can express it uh, with clients is if and when I can convert it into a risk metric. So I don't want this client to do, go to a certain space close to the line, uh, but what I do say, but I don't for a whole host of ethical reasons, internal to me. Uh, but what I say is, you don't want to do that because if it shows up on Wall Street Journal, name your uh, newspaper, you'll wish you just hadn't done it. It's not worth it. And so I use that as the, the point of leverage or the way to convey it. Um, you know, is that the limit of where ethics comes in? Uh, or should ethics be guiding me, my ethics be guiding me more or less differently? Um, you know, can, can they shape the degree to which I give tax advice? Or, you know, and another piece of that is how much, and someone had mentioned this earlier in the context, and I'm trying to remember who it was, Scott, possibly you, uh, whether or not we need to be clearer about the duties of a lawyer and duties of advocacy and where the limits of advocacy are. Um, so I just kind of put that out to you, sort of, you know, how much can I use my ethics to guide 
uh, what I say? And do I have to stop when it, I can't back it up with a, um, a risk scenario? Scott. So I'll, I'll take that invitation. Um, that's a great question. And one obviously that does create a lot of controversy within the legal ethics community. I mean, I would come back to this um, issue that we talked about before of the role of the lawyer as advisor. And I think there's a distinction between what you can do and what you should do. I think the advising rule clearly permits the lawyer to put forth arguments for client conduct that transcend sort of narrow legal technical compliance and specifically um, allow lawyers to raise issues that relate to moral, economic, social, and political factors. And those can come from the perspective of the lawyer themselves or for, from sort of broader social, social perspectives. Um, and I think that's, that's important. Uh, whether or not that's an effective way to leverage or nudge or um, persuade your client to do what you think is the right thing is another question. And it might be more effective as a matter of client counseling to do what Diane just suggested, which is to frame the kind of uh, moral, social, political uh, concerns in a, in, a, in a risk management framework or in a framework of like, this could end up in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, do you want that? Um, but that doesn't mean that you're not permitted to raise considerations around fairness of the system, systemic values, um, you know, political consequences, redistributive consequences as a way of advising your client about the, the factors they need to consider in making these kinds of really difficult judgments. So my own personal view is that lawyers should be engaged in that. I think there's a tactical and contextual question around how effective that is in particular contexts, and, and that's a difficult question. Thank you. Elaine and then Henry. Yeah, I, I agree with what Scott is saying, but I think you, there also has to be a recognition that tax practitioners, and I'm probably I'm coming from the accounting side predominantly, but, but it obviously includes lawyers, but um, they have a duty to advise their clients. So you could actually be accused of negligence if you don't give some of those options, you know, in terms of structuring deals and so on, if you don't give the, a full comprehensive level of advice. So I think there, there needs to be, that needs to be taken into account. I, the public interest has been mentioned a couple of times, and I think we, certainly as an accountant, we would distinguish between an auditor and a tax practitioner, uh, both of whom are, can be accountants, but the auditor very much acts in the interest of the shareholders, and, and the function of the audit is to go in and make sure that things are being conducted to, in the interest of the shareholders, whereas um, a, a tax practitioner who's engaged by the financial controller or whatever actually is much more of an advocate for that person they're not necessarily they don't have a the, the public interest role in the same way to shareholders so i think that's also worth thinking about in the context of distinguishing the public interest and also the 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 duty to act in the interests of the client and um, where that come you know how that that matches then with the ethics of the tax practitioner. I think it's a little bit, it goes back to what uh, Nina was saying, what, those buckets of categories where you have a cautious tax practitioner, cautious taxpayer, that's fine. If you have a very ambitious taxpayer or somebody who's willing to pay that, play that lot, lotto kind of um, audit lottery versus a conservative taxpayer. But again, this is where I would go back to that relationship of trust between the two. And if you're a, a trusted advisor throughout the, you know, the, the lifetime of a, of a taxpayer, I think they're much more likely to listen to you and be guided by you. Thank you. Um, Henry, then Daniel. Yeah, uh, supporting what Elaine said, that you, you have that obligation to provide uh, the uh, client those various options, even though you may not agree with them. But if they choose an option that you don't agree with, I think you have a question to ask yourself as the professional advisor. Am I personally really comfortable <clears throat> in uh, uh, executing uh, that strategy? And just because it's, uh, it's legal and the client is willing to take the risks, uh, am I as that professional uh, 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 should I be doing this? I, that's a question that um, each individual uh, has to answer for him or herself. Uh, we have uh, all very well 
educated and smart people on this panel, but I suspect uh, in many cases, you would have five or six different approaches, all of which could be convincing, uh, but you, you, you know, the, the old saying, the buck stops here, right? Uh, you have to be the one who's ultimately making that decision. And, and if a client wants to pursue this and you as a professional are not comfortable, you have to uh, disengage and say, I I'm sorry, I, I just can't help you. Thank you. Daniel. Yeah, you know, just um, quickly, the, you, there are situations where there are ethical dilemmas in which you follow one uh, tradition and give give one answer and another tradition, you, you have another answer. Then there are other types of situations which people call it are ethical dilemmas, but they're not, uh, because uh, no matter which tradition you follow, the same answer comes out. Um, and if uh, and if the and if the alternative answer is being proposed by your client, you need to point that out, that there's no ethical tradition that supports this view. On the other hand, uh, if they have have an ethical tradition does support the view, that seems you have to respect it, particularly since you're a fiduciary. And if you have to choose between one approach or another approach, and they're both ethical, you should advise them to, to, to do the one that's in their uh, in their best interest, uh, which oftentimes means pecuniary best interest. Um, so uh, um, I think there has to be some tolerance of diversity when there is a, 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 an honest disagreement on a, on a dilemma. But when it's just a misperception on the part of the client that there's an ethical uh, basis for this when there really isn't, then it seems to me you're 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 morally obligated to 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 take that stance or point that out. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well we've come to the end of this session. I had more questions, but I'll hold and weave them into our final and third. Uh, third panel. Uh, so we will take our 15 minute break and come back just two minutes or so uh, past the top of the hour, one o'clock my time, but again, the top of the hour, probably wherever you are. So we'll see you all again shortly.